Hello, hello, welcome. You're doing this as part of PS 101, uh, Introduction to Astronomy for the Summer. Uh, this is week one, part one. Um, no, wow, I'm, my brain stopped. It is week four, part one. <laughs> Uh, which is all about stars and the lives of stars. Um, if you're doing this along as part of the course, then you are working on worksheet seven. My windows are all a mess today. Worksheet seven and reading seven. Um, so we're going to start with the HR diagram or the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. Uh, which is a concept that we've already looked at when we looked at the luminosity of stars, uh, luminosity, temperature, and radius of stars, and how those were all interconnected. I'm trying to fix my slides as I go. Um, if you look at some cluster of stars, uh, again, this, this picture keeps cropping up because it's pretty awesome. Um, this is a, a, an open excuse me, globular cluster, um, part of the Milky Way that was imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope. We really like looking at clusters because, uh, side note, um, finding the distances to stars isn't always straightforward. So we've talked about the parallax method, but that only works out to a certain distance in our Milky Way. Um, to find the distance of things much further away, you need more indirect methods. So one way to know you've got a whole bunch of stars that are roughly the same distance from us uh, is to look at a cluster, because then you can compare um, the brightnesses of those stars to each other. And even if you don't know the absolute brightness, you know what they are compared to each other. And you know they're all at the same distance, so you can compare them um, that way. Anyway, small side note um, why I keep showing this cluster picture. Uh, but also because the color is so stunning in this picture and it really highlights the range of colors that you can see for stars because again the blue stars are going to be your hottest stars it's going to go blue white yellow orange red red is the coolest stars um, with temperatures around 50,000 kelvin again uh, weird weird unit of measure basically celsius uh, at that level uh, and uh, 3,000 kelvin so you can arrange these stars based on their brightness or their luminosity and their temperature. You can plot them on this diagram. The star's position on this diagram doesn't tell us anything about where it is in space. It has nothing to do with where that star is in the galaxy. But it does tell us what temperature that star is at. So if you pick the sun, for example, you could go down to the x-axis and read the temperature off. It's close to 6,000. Uh, it doesn't say which, what type of units this is, which is super not useful. Um, it's probably Celsius or Kelvin. Or you can start from the sun and go to the y-axis, and it is one in units of luminosity of the sun. So it's one compared to itself. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the units that you can use for luminosity numbers get large and out of hand. So we like to do things like compare it to the sun, which is the thing that we know best. Um, so this bottom axis, this x axis is backwards in that hot is or high numbers is on the left and cool numbers is on the right. Again, because of, I mean, it's, it's because of um, historical reasons, I guess we did the O, B, A, F, G, K, M across the bottom to start with. Um, Luminosity uh, goes from dim on the bottom to bright on the top. And there are these patterns that show up, uh, which is going to help us in understanding stars a little bit better. Um, there's a stripe of stars from the top left to the bottom right. Um, that's usually the most obvious part of the diagram, depending on, on what you're looking at. Um, that is called the main sequence. So that's where most of the stars are. Uh, if it has a certain temperature, if it has a certain low temperature, it'll have a low luminosity. If it has a high temperature, it tends to have a high luminosity. That's the trend that you see for most stars. And those stars, again, called main sequence stars. Um, if you go a bit higher, so there are a bunch of stars that don't fit on that main sequence. There's a bunch of them that are brighter uh, for a given temperature, those are called giants and supergiants. 
Not too surprising because if these are the same temperature as these, right? If this temperature, this star here is the same temperature as this star down in the main sequence, but it's brighter. Hey, it's probably bigger. It's got to be bigger at the same temperature to be brighter. Um, just like in uh, if you did that activity with the the burners on the electric stove, there are two burners at the same temperature. The one's itty bitty, the one's really big. You want to put your big pot of pasta on the really big one um, because you're going to get more energy out of that. So giants are larger typically than main sequence stars. Super giants are a lot larger than main sequence stars, and they can range in temperature and color from blue to red. There's also a small cluster of stars, tiny stars down here, um, which are really hot, but not very bright. So if they're really hot, but not very bright, they must be a lot smaller than the stars on the main sequence. And so these are called white dwarfs. Uh, white because, again, their colors, usually white, blue, white, um, because of their hot temperatures and dwarfs because they're, they're tinier stars. There is a, a really cool little video um, I will have to put this video link on the optional additional uh, materials page for this for this lesson. But there's this little video that gives you an idea of the size differences between different types of stars, um, starting with planets. Um, so it starts with uh, the moon. So actually, no, I lied. It starts with Mercury. Um, it's a little computer simulated Mercury. Mars, Venus, and Earth in this top left box here um, showing their relative sizes. And Earth is something we can imagine at least, you know, even if we've only been to a few tiny parts of it. Then it zooms out from the Earth. And there's the Earth down there at the bottom of panel two and shows you how big uh, Nep uh, yeah, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter are compared to um, Earth. And then we have to zoom out again. There's Jupiter, that little doodad. Uh, Jupiter, a red dwarf star. The sun, so this is the sun compared to Jupiter. Uh, and Sirius, which is a, uh, that was a star we mentioned when we talked about magnitudes. It's the brightest star in the night sky. Then you zoom out again, there's Sirius. And you start to get into these massive, massive, massive giants. Uh, this again, I think is Sirius as well. This little blue doodad here. No, I lied, that's Rigel. Ha. Because that's Aldebaran, that's Aldebaran, Rigel, uh, and Tari's Betelgeuse, star you may have heard of, um, and these really massive, massive stars. So these things can get huge. Um, the video gives you a little bit more of a sense of zooming out and zooming out as you get to larger and larger things. But this is uh, useful because it tells us a little bit about the HR diagram, uh, how stars are organized in it. Um, and the fact that we can use their temperature and their luminosity to say something about their relative sizes. So the highlight and the takeaway from this is that the HR diagram sort stars by luminosity or brightness and temperature spectral type. So next, we're going to take this information um, that we've learned so far about stars and talk about star formation and star lifetimes. Um, and a little thought experiment, something I want you to think about um, this may show up as a question either on the discussion board or possibly one of the exams, I can't remember. <laughs> um, stars, as you may know, live for a ridiculously long time. And humans, uh, as you know, don't live nearly as long as stars. So how do we figure out what the lifetime of a star is? We're talking millions to billions of years. Um, when we humans only live like, gee, if we're really lucky, like a whole century. Um, so that's something to, to think about. Uh, think about that process of what, how do we, we look around and take a survey of all the stars around us and have to sort that um, into a kind of a, a growth sequence of how stars start as baby stars uh, and form and become um, middle-aged stars and old stars. So the kind of the key takeaway for this lesson is that mass determines the lifetime of a star. So when a star is born, talk about how in just a sec, it is born with a certain amount of mass. Um, 
the mass of the sun is something like 10 to the 31, so one with 31 zeros after it, kilograms? Good luck. I, I can't even begin to imagine that much matter. Uh, but that's the sun, and that's like, eh, it's a middle-ish star. <laughs> um, some people say it's a little bigger than middle-sized, but whatever. Um, whatever mass the star is born with, when it is born determines how long it sits there, uh, it, how long of a life it lives. And we'll get into the different stages of its lifetime in just a second. Um, one way we know, the one reason the main sequence pops out at us so well on the HR diagram uh, is we're taking a snapshot of stars in one particular slice of their life. And if there's a lot of stars in this main sequence, that means that's probably a a stage of development where stars spend a lot of time, right? So we're catching a lot of stars in that stage because they spend a lot of time there. Um, and the star's math <clears throat> determines its whole life cycle, not just how long it's on the main sequence, um, which is, is uh, kind of where it spends most of its life. Uh, again, where isn't like, like where in space, but where on the diagram. Um, but it determines everything from the star birth to its, its evolution, to its main lifetime, to its death cycle. Everything is determined by how much mass it has to start with. So to give you some perspective, this I love getting to this part of the course because I get to show all the pretty pictures, uh, fun pretty pictures after we've done all the, you know, physics-y stuff. Stars are born in clouds. Um, the space between stars has gas and dust in it, uh, this is what makes up something called the interstellar medium. So it's the medium that's between stars. Um, and in some places, that medium can get dense enough that you can form stars. So this is a, a gorgeous Hubble image um, showing you some stars that are lighting up. A nebula, which is the gas, gas in space called, called a nebula, um, and then blocked by some of the darker stuff, the dust um, that's out there. You may have seen this picture. This is one of the most famous images from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, these are uh, it's M16, or the Eagle Nebula, or the Pillars of Creation uh, is one popular nickname for it. These are huge, dense gas clouds. And inside these gas clouds, there are stars forming um, inside these huge pillars. I mean, these are like light years big. These are way bigger than anything in our solar system. Um, in fact, each one of those little, those little, I want to say they look like little dinosaurs. Um, those little knobs that look like little dinosaurs uh, is another uh, star and potential solar system that's that's forming in that in that cloud. So because it's cloudy, <laughs> because it's full of dust and gas, uh, it's really difficult to see that. Um, but this is that same nebula. So this is the nebula imaged in visible light. This is that same nebula imaged in infrared light, also from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, this one was a much more recent image. Um, this one came out at a conference I think it was actually at a few years ago. Uh, in infrared, you don't see as much of the gas and dust, but you do see the stars that are inside it and some behind it and in front of it. Um, but you can start to see the stars that are forming inside of it using infrared telescopes, using other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So imagine what's actually happening. Um, these are still images from, <clears throat> not from the real universe, but from a simulation. A lot of times since we can't sit around and wait a billion years to see what stars do, we simulate that physics in a computer. Um, this is a particular simulation that started with a spherical gas cloud and told it, <laughs> basically it tells it physics. <laughs> it's like, here's a gas cloud, here's how gravity works, Here's how gas behaves. Here's all the equations of physics as we know them. Go! And it lets it run its little simulation as if it's its own little contained universe with the physics that we know uh, and these particles of gas. And what happens over time is the gas doesn't stay in that uniform sphere. It starts to break apart and, and collapse. And you get these really dense regions. That's what the white and yellow you're seeing here. These really dense regions where the gas can become dense enough to form stars. The 
process by which this happens is actually super complicated and we don't quite understand all the details of it. Star formation is a pretty hot topic in astrophysical research. But the general picture is there, is that you have these large gas clouds, they collapse um, on themselves and form these dense pockets which can form a star. Um, what's actually happening there is that gravity overcomes something called thermal pressure in a cloud. So if you have a cloud of material with, you know, particles moving around in it, um, the gravity has to overcome that motion of the particles randomly moving around and hitting each other to pull pieces of it together. And what helps is that there's these molecules in this gas cloud and they give off emission lines. So we've talked about emission lines from atoms, molecules do them too. Um, and it can give off energy by giving off light and becoming lower energy and kind of slowing down. Um, and so it, it can collapse into a smaller sphere, which would form your star. So when you start to get this, this collapsing ball of gas that's on its way to becoming a star, but not there yet, we call it a protostar. So proto before beginning star. Um, so the matter keeps falling into the protostar. Um, and the protostar, so this is showing a protostar uh, or cluster of protostars. Nope, sorry, just one protostar. Um, that is still embedded in some of the gas and dust from its, its birth. And that gas and dust is being blown away to the left because there's off to the right, not in this image, there's a whole bunch of like really energetic blue hot white stars, um, you know, just you know, just nailing it um, with uh, ultraviolet radiation and stellar winds. Um, but eventually, yeah, so the, the, either the stars themselves or nearby stars blow that gas away and shuts down star formation. Inside, um, for each of these systems, uh, we have the beginnings of solar systems forming. This is, oh no, I think it's infrared. Um, it could be radio. I should know. Oh, it's NRAO, so it's got to be a radio image. Okay, this is an image taken with a radio telescope of one of those protostars. Um, can't really see the star itself in radio. It doesn't give off a whole lot of radio waves. But the disk of, of molecules around it and these little jets that come out of the other end um, match this little picture here, which is our um, simulation of what it looks like when you form solar systems. Um, so you have potential planets that are forming around this baby star. Um, this is in one of the Orion star forming regions. So uh, a, a diagram of, of what that looks like um, for a, a particular star or, or stellar system. You have these molecular clouds. So you have these clouds of gas that have started to condense uh, and they collapse due to gravity, all comes together. Um, this is getting smaller and smaller as you go. Uh, some of that material collapses into the very center to make the star. Uh, some of that material sticks around in a disk around it. Some of that material gets blown away in this jet and you never see it again. Um, eventually you end up with a disk that starts to clean itself up as planets form in it. Um, and then you can end up with uh, a star system or a planetary system with a star in the middle. Um, and these planets going around it. This, uh, so this is a diagram showing how we think this works. This is uh, an actual image, and this one is, I believe, an optic. Yes, it, it's this is optical and infrared. Um, this is the you can see the jet coming out. You can't see the protostar itself, so I think this is optical. Um, but you can see the disk of material, dusty material blocking it. You can see this outflow of material because um, not everything makes its way all the way into the star. So, um, so this continues to happen um, and the Milky Way, just for the record, creates about one sun-sized, <laughs> sun mass star per year uh, on average. Um, so when do we actually call it a star? It's a protostar until it becomes a star and it becomes a star when you have nuclear fusion in the core. Nuclear fusion is the process um, by which the sun and all the other stars give off light and heat and energy. Um, the way this happens very generally is you have four hydrogen atoms. So essentially four protons. Um, they come together and they form a helium atom. But in order to do that, notice two of these protons turned into a different particle, neutron. Uh, and if you add up the mass of these hydrogen atoms, 
and you compare it to the mass of the helium atom that you get at the end, you'll find the mass of the hydrogen atoms combined is more than the mass of the helium atom, which means, where did the mass go? Uh, you can't, mass can't be created or destroyed. Actually, it can. Uh, you can have mass change into energy and energy change back into mass. So that extra mass that seems to have disappeared turns into energy. That's what this little gamma light thing is showing you. Um, with the most famous equation of all, you don't need to know this equation, but I'm sure you've heard it somewhere before, E equals mc squared. The energy that you get out of some bit of matter or mass um, is equal to the amount of mass times the speed of light squared. Light, really fast, speed of light's really high. You square it, it's even higher from a tiny bit of mass. You can get a lot, a lot of energy. Uh, unfortunately, um, that has been used to create nuclear weapons. Um, it takes a very, very small amount of mass to create a huge amount of destruction, and that's before the radiation even hits. Um, just the destruction of a nuclear weapon itself comes from this equation. Um, but uh, it can be used for more benign reasons, um, for nuclear power plants, uh, and, and the, the best example for us is the sun, is this fusion process that happens in the sun, giving the sun all the heat, giving off all the heat and light that our planet needs for the 10 billion years that our sun is around. So that is the moment when a star is born. And stars are born um, typically together. Um, you have a bunch that are born in one cloud together. And you tend to get, and this is pretty true when, wherever you look around the universe, you get a lot of little stars. This doesn't even, this doesn't even cover. Um, the fact that this line keeps going up out of the screen. For every, you know, large, massive, this is 100 mass, 100 times the mass of the sun, for every one of those, you get like a whole bunch of these, these are just 10 times the mass of the sun. If you keep going up, uh, you're gonna get lots and lots more the size of the sun. The universe tends to make lots of little things and few small things in these random processes. Um, think about if you're on the beach, uh, how many grains of sand there are versus how many pebbles there are. Um, typically you see a lot more green, tiny grains of sand than you see pebbles, than you see boulders. Um, universe tends to make more tiny things. So you make lots and lots and lots of small stars, you make a decent amount of mid middle-sized stars, and you make very few really massive um, big stars. Once a star is born, that fusion turns on, the star becomes stable. It's no longer collapsing, right? Every, while it was a protostar, there was stuff falling into it. Uh, it was still collapsing in on itself. Um, gravity is still working to pull the star together, but it's being balanced by the pressure from the nuclear fusion in the core. So you have gravity pushing down, fusion pushing out. It makes the star a nice, fairly stable sphere. Um, how long that sphere is stable depends on a couple of things. Depends on, in particular, the mass of the star. Um, yeah, keep going. Okay, um, if you have a much larger star, the core pressure and temperature is really high. So you think, okay, larger star has more mass more hydrogen, that hydrogen fuels fusion. So that should last a long time, right? Not so. If you have a larger star, it's a hotter um, core. So fusion happens a lot, 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 lot faster. So really, really big stars with a lot of mass, they go through fusion faster. That makes them really, really hot. So the big stars, they're massive, they're really hot, they actually run out of their fuel faster. Smaller star isn't as hot in its core. Fusion happens more slowly. So although it's a smaller star, um, that mass, that hydrogen, that fuel lasts for a long, long time. Um, so it's the smaller stars are dim and, and last a long time. The big stars are super, super bright um, and live short lifetimes. So you could think like, live quiet, live long, live big and loud, and I guess die young um, is, is kind of the analogy that's often um, used for this. So the takeaway from this is that the mass 
of a star, when it's born, that's when it becomes a main sequence star, when it's born, uh, determines the core pressure and temperature. Stars of higher mass have higher temperatures, more rapid fusion, make them really bright, more luminous, but shorter lived because they run through their fuel so much faster. Stars of low mass have a cool core, slower fusion rates, lower luminosities, uh, so dim, and long lifetimes. And if I show this to you on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, this is showing a bunch of stars, all, just the main sequence stars, none of the giants or anything weird like that. Uh, up here, so this is between 10 and 30 times the mass of the sun, are these big hot blue stars. You go down to about six, three, sun sized is down here. Uh, and then all these red dwarfs. So remember, the universe makes a lot of these, not so many of these. But look at their lifetimes. The lifetime of these up here, these are like 20 solar masses. Um, that's 10 to the seven years. So one with seven zeros after that is, I'm going to mess this up, 10 million? 10 million, something like that. Um, years. for that. That's like a 20 mass star. Uh, this one is 10 to the 8th, that's 100 million. This one's 10 to the 9th, that's 1, no, excuse me, billion. Hun yeah, that's a billion. Uh, the sun is 10 to the 10, that's 10 billion. That's 10 billion years that the sun can live in a stable state. Down here is, is 100 billion. Hey, guess what? Our universe is 13 billion years old, so these stars haven't run out of fuel yet. Um, so the mass it's born with tells you it's temperature, right? If it doesn't have a lot of mass, it's, it's, it's cooler. If it has a lot of mass, it's hotter. It's luminosity. So if it doesn't have a lot of mass, it's dim. If it has a lot of mass, it's bright. And how long it lives. If it's uh, massive, it runs out of fuel faster. Um, and if it's smaller, it takes a long time. And we're break, gonna break these up generally uh, into high mass stars, which are eight times the mass of the sun, and intermediate and low mass stars, which are less than eight. Um, the sun is considered a low mass star, according to that, or not very special. So uh, if you're going along with the worksheets for this, um, there's a short, short worksheet about um, star formation and lifetimes uh, that'll let you practice some of this. So what happens when a star does run out of fuel? This is when things get interesting. So although the sun will sit, <laughs> I'm basically saying the 10 billion years that the sun is fusing hydrogen to helium is not that interesting. Um, I mean, it's important, but it's nothing cool happens. What happens after that fusion shuts down is what's really funky. And what happens depends on uh, the mass of the star. Hey, running theme here. Stars are formed in generally the same way, whether they're small or large. If they're small, they're going to go through a certain evolutionary path. Don't worry, we're going to go through each of these in the next few slides. Um, and if they're massive, they go through a different evolutionary path. But first of all, I want to show you a realistic HR diagram, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for two star clusters. Uh, the yellow one is called M67, the, T, or the one that's plotted in yellow. The one that's plotted in teal is NGC188. Um, these are two open clusters in the Milky Way. Um, the astronomers have plotted, have measured their temperatures and the, and the magnitudes of each star and plotted them carefully on this graph. And you see um, that there is this, uh, you know, thick line. There's a bunch of scatter around here. You sometimes pick up other stars in the field that aren't part of the cluster. Um, but then this really thick part here is from um, the stars uh, that are on the main sequence. So these are all of the little red giant star, or excuse me, red dwarf stars. They're tiny, they're cool, uh, they don't give off a lot of light. Then you get to the medium-sized stars and the large stars. But there's no really, really big stars. This part of the diagram is empty. Wonder why? Those have short lifetimes. Oh, so this these clusters may have been formed these clusters, the, all the stars formed together, um, were formed l long enough ago that all those stars are already dead. <laughs> dead and gone and gone. Um, but you see that there's this little, like, the stars are kind of peeling off the, her the main sequence. 
Um, the stars are a little bit higher on the yellow one and a little bit lower on the teal one. And this is a, a concept, something called the main sequence turnoff. Uh, you'll be doing a lab this week that looks very closely at this concept. Um, but basically, as the stars run out of fuel, um, they turn into, spoiler alert, a couple slides, they turn into red giants. Um, so if they become a red giant, bam, it shows up over here, or here, or here, or here, or here, um, on the diagram, you know, somewhere up and to the right of where it was. So it's peeling, excuse me, peeling off the diagram. You can tell how old the cluster is by seeing what's the, what's the star that's gonna die next? It's a little morbid. Um, but you can figure out the temperature of the star that's like on the edge and about to go off. That's the age, that star's lifetime is the age of the cluster. You can see this a little bit. Um, this is showing a life track of a single star, a theoretical life track uh, of what's happening. This gray, you can ignore, this is kind of the protostar stage. And you get to a star that turns on nuclear fusion, has a certain temperature, boop. It has a certain luminosity, boop, and it's gonna sit there for however many millions or billions of years doing its thing. When it runs out of fuel, it starts to get bigger and redder. So you have um, the star runs out of fuel in the center, so the center starts to collapse, but it loses track of the outer layers. It starts to expand. So as it's expanding, it's becoming larger, so it's becoming brighter. But because there's nothing fueling it as it gets bigger, it starts to cool down. So it gets redder and it gets brighter and it becomes a red giant. So the star will appear to move on this plot. Remember, it's not moving in space. It's just changing its temperature and luminosity uh, and become a red giant. We call this a uh, broken thermostat. So the thermostat is the thing that keeps your house at a certain temperature. If it gets too hot, it turns the AC up. If it gets too cold, turns the heat on, assuming you have a fancier house than I have. Um, but the, theoretically, a, a, a good thermostat will do that. Um, the thermostat of the sun is that you have gravity pushing in and, and fusion pressure pushing out. Um, but when that breaks, when the fusion stops working, parts of it start to contract and part of it starts to expand. Um, so the luminosity increases because the thermostat's broken. Um, there's a little bit of fusion happening outside the core, which is powering it, pushing it further out, uh, and while the core itself is, is totally shrinking. So a star like the sun um, will change in time. Uh, it's going from right to left. This is, you know, it's a protostar, it forms, I blocked that out. Um, star, 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 star. Oh, hey, fusion turned off. Uh, I'm going to expand. <laughs> uh, I'm going to expand some more. I'm going to expand some more. Um, sometimes you can have helium fusion in a star like the sun or, or a smaller star, um, which will make it expand and contract, expand and contract, and kind of bounce back and forth. But generally, it's some kind of red giant um, during this phase. Now, for a star like the sun, uh, or all stars less than eight times the mass of the sun, at some point, it's gonna run out of stuff to make fusion. It's just never gonna have enough material to be hot enough in the core to fuse stuff at some point. So what happens then is the core starts to shrink indefinitely or continues to shrink until it stops due to it, there being so much pressure. And the outer layers continue to expand until they come off the star to become something called a planetary nebula. So this is an example, this is called the Ring Nebula. Uh, if you do manage to get outside for your observing project, have someone show you the Ring Nebula. It's pretty high up in the sky. Again, Northern Hemisphere observers, mid-latitudes. Um, it's pretty high up in the sky uh, all summer. It's a fairly easy object to find. It looks like it won't be nearly this colorful to your eye because your eye is not the Hubble telescope. Um, looks like a little smoke ring uh, when I look at it from our observatory at St. Anselm. Um, but this, these, this gas was the outer layers of a star like our sun that came off of the star, uh, leaving behind a little tiny white dwarf. So a white dwarf, hey, we've seen those. It's on our HR diagram. They're really, really hot, uh, but really, really tiny. So it's the core of a star that's lost its outer material. So the inside is still hot, um, but it has you know, collapsed down to a much smaller object. So the sun, 
will, uh, this is the fate of our sun. We've got another five billion years or so before the sun turns into a red giant, spends some time as a red giant, and then loses its outer layers and becomes a white dwarf. To give you an idea of the size of a white dwarf, white dwarf is about the size of the earth. And here's the earth compared to the sun. So the core of the sun, the current core, will collapse down to the size of the earth uh, on the sun. And that is diagrammed here. This was the top half of that diagram I showed you from cloud to star to red giant to planetary nebula. Planetary nebula is a really short lived stage. It's only like 10,000 years or so. Short lived in astronomical terms. Um, and then the white dwarf is what's left behind. High mass stars do something a little more exciting. High mass stars will um, become a red giant. And then the inner, the core will collapse until it gets hot enough to fuse helium. Uh, but eventually it'll run out of helium. And after the helium, it starts to fuse what helium made, which was carbon. Um, and then the carbon fuses into neon. And then the neon fuses into oxygen. And then the oxygen fuses into silicon. You don't need to know this order, I swear. Um, and the silicon, what's interesting is the silicon fuses into iron. So it's it makes all of these elements inside the star uh, going through these pulsating red giant phases um, until you get down to iron, which is a something that you cannot fuse to make energy. In fact, the star <laughs> tries to make fusion happen. Um, the, the iron core collapses. Iron tries to fuse together to make the next heavy element it wants to make. And instead of giving off energy, it takes energy in. So it takes an energy and it takes an energy and it takes an energy until the core just collapses on itself until it can collapse no more and it explodes. So when that happens, we have a supernova. So this is our shell diagram. It collapses into the center and then this red bit showing it exploding back out, um, obliterating most of what was uh, the original massive star. This happens to stars, again, not our sun, but stars that are eight times the mass of our sun and larger. Um, so iron will build up um, and uh, until it can no longer resist and then collapse and explode. I do a really fun demo with this little thing. Um, you can do it at home if you have really good aim. If you hold a basketball and a tennis ball and drop them simultaneously, the basketball will bounce off the floor, give some energy to the tennis ball, which is also falling, and send the tennis ball like flying somewhere. Um, I do, I like doing that in class. I have not filmed it yet because it's probably terrible. I'll probably break something. But that is the essence of a supernova when a star explodes. When a star explodes in a supernova, that supernova can be as bright as the entire galaxy that the star is in. So a star is made of, uh, sorry, excuse me, a galaxy is made of 100 billion stars. That one supernova could be as bright as the rest of that galaxy. And what's left, the gas cloud left, that nebula, it's called a supernova remnant, can last um, for uh, thousands to, I don't want to say millions, but it might just be thousands of years uh, after that. So we can see, even if we don't catch a supernova when it happens, uh, we can see these remnants of a massive star that exploded. This is the Crab Nebula, can be seen from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, really hard one to find, I haven't seen it with my own eye. Um, it's the remnant of a supernova that was seen and recorded in the year 1054. So the supernova was recorded and seen by astronomers uh, who had no telescopes back then. Um, and it wasn't until um, much later that this was rediscovered, the nebula was rediscovered um, as being what was left over. So I told you that the massive stars create uh, all of those elements inside of them. Well, the supernova creates basically all the rest. That is an oversimplification. But almost all of the elements in the periodic table, hope you've seen a periodic table before, it lists all the, the types of atoms um, from hydrogen, which is the simplest, to helium, uh, to things we're really used to every day, like carbon, uh, aluminum, uh, gold's in there somewhere, uh, to uranium is down here. Um, all of these elements, so the, the way this is color-coded, some of these were created by humans, they're not stable in nature, 
everything else was created in some astrophysical process. The Big Bang created hydrogen and helium and a tiny bit of lithium. And that's it. Beginning of the universe, there were three elements. <laughs> All of these others were formed in some way by stars or stellar processes. Low mass stars can make some of the ones that are in green. Um, uh, exploding massive stars, that's the supernova, that makes all the ones that are colored yellow, and you see some elements are made in multiple processes. And then another type of supernova where a white dwarf itself explodes uh, is in the gray ones, uh, and neutron stars, which I'm going to get to in a second, they were, that was observed um, a little over a year ago now, uh, 2018, summer 2018 when I'm recording this, um, neutron stars merging form all the ones uh, all the purple elements. So all of the awesome stuff in the periodic table, but particularly look at carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. That's the stuff that mostly makes us up. That was made in stars. That was made from uh, star stellar fusion or from a star exploding. Um, really creates most of the, all the interesting stuff in the universe outside of hydrogen and helium. So that overview of stellar nebula to massive star to red supergiant to supernova, what's left after a supernova, what was the core can either form a neutron star or a black hole. I'm not gonna get super into detail for either of these. Uh, a neutron star is when a ball of particles called neutrons uh, collapse. It, it makes it denser and smaller than a white dwarf. Uh, and if it collapses beyond that point, uh, there's nothing that can prevent it from collapsing to an infinitely small point. Uh, so you get a really small but really massive dense object called a black hole. Uh, and the size of these things, if you put the packed, the mass, amount of mass in the sun uh, into the density of a neutron star or the radius of a black hole, it would be about the size of a city. Um, this is chilling over Manhattan. So here, oh, actually, no, this is, this is not. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's completely covering Manhattan. Um, there's Staten Island where I grew up. Uh, but that, that's New York City, Manhattan there, uh, one of the five boroughs. Uh, there's like Brooklyn and Queens and... The Bronx is up here. Um, sorry. But if you packed the mass of the sun into a neutron star, it would be the size of a city. A teaspoonful of neutron star matter would be like the weight of some ridiculous number of elephants. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. Um, but these really bizarre, weird objects that we have observed uh, come from these massive explosions. So if you're playing along at home with the worksheets, you will be doing a brief worksheet on stellar evolution where you'll be explaining this and drawing this out as a diagram. Um, the highlights being that low mass stars go through a red giant phase and then lose mass to become a planetary nebula and leave behind a white dwarf. High mass stars go through several types of fusion, also red giants, uh, until they get to iron, which causes them to explode in a supernova, leaving behind a neutron star or a black hole. That is stellar evolution in one tiny nutshell. I will uh, see you on the discussion boards as we talk about that this week.